Okay. Or it seems to work. Okie dokie. So. In my presentation, this is on genetic algorithms. And I would like to demonstrate for you genetic algorithms uh, in a pretty quick, quick, clear, intuitive method. So I originally had present 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 presentation at PowerPoint set up. and unfortunately despite having this PowerPoint and presentation and all this stuff set up it 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 PowerPoint I can't record my voice. So due to these technical problems, I instead ended up just I'm gonna have to go off the slides and mail you the slides and do my presentation, my voice part here. Fun. Just idly do this while uh, giving this presentation. Okay, so how do you, first of all, the genetic algorithms, we're gonna go through first how genetics themselves work. Genetics are the parents carrying DNA, which are chemical blueprints of themselves, DNA, mDNA, etc. When reproducing, this DNA is mixed. Half of the DNA comes from the mother, half comes from the father, and most common forms of sexual reproduction. Um, the gamete will have 23 chromosomes and each parent, these two gametes meet, well 23 in the case of a human, these two gametes meet and produce the offspring, the zygote, the first cell of the offspring, which is 46 cell uh, chromosomes in a human. So the child is a result of the mixing in the parent of random DNA splitting go on with, you know, hierarchy and a, a very long explanation would involve things like dominant and recessive traits, but purposes of this very basic explanation, we don't need. So it's a mix of 23 of some, 23 of the other in a human. Half one, half of the other, six of one, half dozen of the other, they mix together, they create the child. Child or children are successful in their adaptation evolutionarily. They will reproduce and pass on this particular mixture which will continue and continue and continue. That doesn't necessarily mean they have to survive. You know, for instance, uh, bunnies are not particularly well adapted to survival. Rabbits are cute, but they're not particularly, you know, they're not fierce predators. They're small little prey animals which breed very fast. Their breeding is their evolutionary adaptation. Because of the fact that they breed so fast, they can continue passing on their genetic material. Rabbits, which are capable of passing on their genetic material very well, are successful rabbits and that's what the, the species continues to evolve towards and become more like them as they pass on their genes. Another example would be, uh, for instance, my, uh, my cat was, when he was young, before we had him fixed, he entered his first heat very early, abnormally early for a cat, unlocked the front door, well didn't unlock it, but Pulled open the front door by going to the handle, pulled open the other handle for the front door, which is one of those turning handles, and promptly let himself out of my apartment. He came back three days later and apparently had been breeding with all the neighborhood cats. He's well adapted to survival. The cat is well adapted to survival, no doubt. His genetic material is being passed on. Cute and useless as he is. So, being a relatively simple thing, genetic algorithms, well, genetics is a fairly simple idea. It's a little more complicated in practice, but it's a simple concept. It was pretty quickly picked up on by you know, mathematics and scientists and engineers as a good way of handling certain types of problems. Genetic algorithms work by having certain parent versions of a design or a program or whatever. A parent you know, version of them. Let's say, for instance, you're designing a turbine to handle 
jet exhaust to get the maximum efficiency out of the jet exhaust from the burning of the jet fuel. You, know, you may have certain degrees of the blade twist, you know, two-dimensional object fluid dynamics. It's very difficult uh, topic. You know, it's not something where there's a perfect example of 110% best solution. It's going to change over idles, over ambient temperature, you know, the wear and tear. Fluid dynamics is themselves extremely complicated. So instead, you have a couple of versions. You test them. You see which ones work, and then you merge. You, 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 let's say the blade at 7 degrees and a blade at 10 degrees both work. Well, okay, and that works too, and maybe a blade at 12 degrees. Let's mix the 7 and 10 and the 10 and 12. So you get blade at 8.5 degrees and blade at 11 degrees or something like that. And then you continue testing and out of these. You, you continuously evolve your solution. Genetic algorithms in computer science work the same way. So usually some form of source code or some in some rare cases self-modifying source code. In other cases it's usually like a system of weighting certain traits or something like that. Acts as a DNA, as a possible configuration. And as this configuration uh, works or doesn't work, ones that don't work are discarded, ones that do work, they're averaged with other ones that work and continue we're reproducing generations of this. This system has actually been used. Uh, an interesting clip on YouTube. You can Google it. I don't remember the link off the top of my head. Somebody actually uh, using a genetic algorithm and a plug-in to make a computer play Mario and win the first level in the least possible moves. Again, I think 500 generations. But it did adapt very well. So yeah, successful solutions are combined. Unsuccessful solutions deleted. That sound familiar? Yeah. Genetics in living organisms work well because there is often no best solution due to the complexity of an environment. There, there is no perfect design, for instance, for a shark because there are different types of waters, different predators, different areas. There's, there's not a perfect shark design. There's not a perfect rabbit design. There's not a perfect cat design. Cat that hunts uh, cat that hunts birds will be more successful in an area where there's a lot of birds and a whole lot of rodents. But if you, for instance, are changing, there's no way of perfectly balancing these traits, all the different traits. It's just not what. It also adapts this this method, these chromosomal adaptation. You know, the the genetics Mendelian genetics adapts well situations where there may not be an ideal form. There, there might actually be an ideal But it would be very, very difficult. You know, there's no intelligent design, so it would be very, very difficult to, for the lack of a better word, produce the best specimen. But, on the other hand, close enough, good enough, is exactly that. That's an acceptable outcome. You don't need a 110% perfect cat. You just need one that listen, catches mice, survives, and produces other small cats. It's also an advantage of the way our, that genetics, Mendelian genetics, and even bacterial genetics, one of their advantages is that the ecosystems that they're in are not static. They're not truly static. Things change. Temperatures change. Everything is interrelated. It's an enormous system. You know, meteorology, mutations of other creatures, etc. It's, it's not life in a petri dish, so to speak. So you're always trying to go for that moving target, and you want to get that good enough solution, that that better or good solution to a moving target. You know, the world, for instance, if you look at the design of a of a cockroach, cockroaches, especially the German cockroach, they're pain in the butt. They're disgusting creatures. They're very difficult to kill. Very uh, notoriously difficult to kill cockroaches. But they're darned well adapted. For human beings, they were well adapted to survival. With human beings, they're still well adapted to survival. Sharks have been relatively static genetically for a very long period of time, too, because they're well adapted to the environment which they live in. Despite the adaptation, they, they both of the, these species generally stumbled on a design that worked pretty well. 
stuck with it, and it changes as it needs to. But it, it has a good mixture of traits which are effective. So genetic algorithms are great for the same sort of situations. Situations where there is no true solution. There's no perfect solution, for instance, for virus recognition on a computer. But a good enough solution is a good enough solution. You can continuously evolve and find better solutions, but there's no perfect solution. And that may seem silly to somebody who doesn't think about viruses, you know, such they just, oh, I got a virus. But if you think about, you know, there's a virus, for instance, might delete a certain system file, but that system file may all, might also be deleted by a diagnostic program. Instead, vir in, in case you're curious, virus scanners use heuristics, which is a fancy word, rule of thumb. And it just has a bunch of these, which continuously change over time. And as, as time goes on, they get better ways of you know, eliminating false positives. And yeah, it, it evolves and adapts. It's also good for problems where the true solution would be impossible to find, as I mentioned, you know, like turbines, fluid dynamics, or you know, some forms of like huge data crunching. For instance, uh, Amazon, you know, it, it, there probably is a perfect algorithm for recommending people their what to buy next, but it would be absolutely exhaustive to find it. Require way too much engineering, but a good enough algorithm is a good enough algorithm. And again solution where it may change over time. People's buying habits might change over time, for instance, with that Amazon example. Example would be technical stock trading, you know, trading stocks off of technical indicators. These indicators, the significance of them may shift over time as technology moves on and as the marketplace dynamics change. And in fact, if anything, they are overheated right now, continuously changing far faster than many existing social norms and institutions can keep up. It's great at hitting that moving target where it's a good enough solution and there might be a perfect solution but it'd be really really difficult to get to but a good enough solution is good enough. That's the advantage of both of them. They also have another couple advantages too. Genetics, you reproduce or you don't. Genetic algorithm, you combine or you don't. Very simple. Very, it only takes a very limited amount of input, very limited amount of external influence. It's also continuously adaptive. You know, let's say, for instance, I have a genetic algorithm which creates, over time, a good solution to, let's say, the steering of a car, you know, some form of active steering. As drivers continuously, oh, it's a better example, uh, self-driving cars, as, as these you know, systems continue and continue and continue and continue. Let's say, for instance, you have one where the, you know, the driver can override it. You, know, you could monitor maybe the driver's patterns of when they override it and how they override it and use this to make the system learn and adapt over time. It can be in a production environment, just like how living creatures can be in and, you know, living and reproducing and doing their thing and, you know, the humpity jumps and all that and the the splitting and the mitosis and all that good stuff, if you're a bacteria. They can be doing that perfectly fine as they're continuously adjusting to, you know, they're, they're, they're able to be used. And it's also very flexible because it can produce an extreme variety of solutions. And if you look at the animal kingdom, you will find an extreme variety of solutions to a plethora of different problems. and. By problems, I mean environments. You know, the problem is always how do I survive, how do I thrive. Both 